Coming up on Tech Thing, Intel and AMD in one chip. Dell's new XPS 15 2-in-1 has Cobby Lake G. Our favorite parts of the Windows 10 April update, best NAS drives, and more. All coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons. Without your support via patreon.com slash tech thing, we wouldn't be able to make the show for you each and every week. Come join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Sometimes two things. <laughs> Once in a great long while, three. I have one amazing thing to show off in today's show, so I'm super excited about this. Oh my goodness. Awesome. Is uh, that the new Dell XPS 15 2-in-1? Yes, it is. Uh, so this was just announced. What? You have a question? What makes it a two-in-one? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, I guess I should show you. Uh, so basically, what makes it a two-in-one is, one, you can use it as a laptop. Two, you can use it as a tablet. Or you wow. can also use it as a tent. So you could turn it like this and sales set it down as well. Sales presentations. Sales presentations. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I actually found that's really useful whenever you're, like, doing a Google Hangout and mm -hmm. you want the webcam to be in the right place. Thank you, Dell. <laughs> then you can have the webcam at the top as opposed to the bottom when it's in the laptop formation. So we have another Infinity Edge display with a super thin bezel and yep. nostril cam. Yes, exactly. But the nostril cam is at the center of the monitor rather than at the it side. It is, which I truly do appreciate very much, but the bezels are still really small on this 2-in-1 as well. So the model that we are reviewing today, this is the new 2018 model that they just came out with, mm -hmm. and we got to see a little bit of it uh, during the CES period of time mm -hmm. earlier this year, but now we actually got to get hands-on with it. So the model that we have, if you look at Patrick's computer, he has the prices pulled up. Uh, the one that we have is $23.99.99 with an MSRP of 2409 so you can save 10 bucks on Dell.com. Oh wait, it's 21.99 today. Quick, order it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it weighs about 4.36 pounds. So it's relatively heavy. I wouldn't say that I'm going to take this with me everywhere, but it's on par with like mm -hmm. some of the gaming rigs that I've messed with. So the big thing about this is the Cobby Lake G processor. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of crazy because they have a $1,300 configuration with a right. Core i5. And yes. it's the same Radeon Vega M graphics it is. All the way up to the to the full the super expensive model. Yeah, so we should probably talk about that. So this all new Dell XPS 15 uh, two and one it features lots of different upgrades and some really interesting changes from the last model. Uh, most notably, those would be the keyboard, the screen, and the CPU. Mm -hmm. So the CPU they've included is an i7. It's the 8705G 3.10 gigahertz CPU. And interestingly enough, this is the Cobby Lake G CPU series that we covered at CES, uh, which we did some little video on previously, but it's the eighth generation line of CPUs. But the G version, weirdly, weirdly, has an Intel HD graphics 620, but it also has a Radeon RX Vega MGL graphics on board with four gigs of memory. So it's Intel with Radeon in one. Is that weird to anybody else? It's been is, bugging is it just you me? since I first talked about it in January. Yeah, is it is it just me? <laughs> or is that is it weird? I mean, it's kind of cool, right? It's kind of cool, but it's, it's it so different. It was weird in January. It's weird now. <laughs> yes, I know. You're not the only ones out there, everybody. It weirds me out, too. But I, it's kind of cool. When you look at the... I, I, I love the, uh, the descriptions of these. When you get to the memory, like, $1,300, 8 gigabytes, DDR4, 2400 megahertz integrated. Right. That's a fancy way for saying the memory soldered down on the motherboard, people. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so the version that we reviewed also has 16 gigs of RAM mm -hmm. and a 512 gig NVMe SSD. You can also get one terabyte for a little bit more money, of course, or you can get a little bit less if you want to save some money. Uh, you are stuck with that amount of RAM, so depending on which one that you decide to purchase, you better intend to use that RAM <laughs> because that's all you're going to get. It is not removable. However, you can remove the back plate to access the NVMe SSD, for example. Uh, the graphics are not as good as my NVIDIA GTX 1060, or which is in my Razer, or like a 1080. It's kind of equivalent to a 1050. Uh, it is better than the usual, just simple built-in Intel yeah. graphics. Yeah, like way better. So for example, I was playing Skyrim on high res because that's my favorite game and I love testing it even though it's old school, but I don't care. You're a chicken killer. I'm a chicken killer. Yeah, There are there are chickens in that <laughs> game and you can kill them and then you can eat the meat. So sorry. If no, I have no, vegan it's friends, like, I apologize. <laughs> I know you're playing Skyrim because like, you'll be on your side of the thing. Yeah. Ha! 
kill the chicken. <laughs> right. I know, it's so funny. He just like randomly hears that out of me in the office. But uh, I noticed that if I was trying to play it with 4K resolutions, mm -hmm. the game froze. <laughs> yeah. But it was perfectly fine with 1080 HD settings in high res on Skyrim. So there's a huge difference between trying to play in 4K and trying to play in 1080p. I also tried rendering a video file with Adobe Premiere Pro, and it took nine minutes and 25 seconds to render an eight minute video. Now comparing that to the uh, Razer that I usually use or the Alienware mm -hmm. that I sometimes use as well, those generally are one to one levels. So okay. it's eight minutes for an eight minute video. So this is a little bit slower, but not bad at all. So those are, are those are, those are last year's Core i7s of those machines? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, exactly. Um, the fans do get a little bit loud whenever you are rendering or doing heavy lifting, but luckily not as loud as the Razer, which basically sounds like a jet engine. Nothing is as loud as the Razer. Exactly. So this brings me to the screen. It is a 15.6 inch 4K UHD display. It's 3840 by 2160 resolution, and it's 433 nits of brightness. So it's very, very bright, especially if you like bringing it outside or something. Uh, it's nearly 100% color accuracy with sRGB colors and Adobe RGB color spaces, and it has very good contrast as well. So I was really, really happy with the screen. It's rather beautiful, and I do have it set to go to sleep because this thing uses a lot of battery, and I will touch on that in a moment. Uh, it also has that infinity edge design, so those nice skinny bezels, anti-reflective touch display, and it also, optionally, you can buy this $100 active pen to use with it, which I found is most compatible whenever you're in like tablet mode and you're trying to draw something. Mm -hmm. However, I did have some issues with this kind of glitching out and randomly like moving yeah. to a different part of the right. screen. So I didn't necessarily think this would be good for an artist. So I mostly just stuck to the keyboard, which we should definitely talk about. Definitely takes some getting used to. It's got these low travel butterfly switches that have magnetic clicky systems which have 0.7 millimeters of travel. So very, very thin travel area in there. And, and the magnetic switches, it's so weird to get used to. For example, when you press the key, the space bar, it makes this really audible click noise, mm -hmm. kind of like a me mechanical keyboard almost, but it it does not t feel like a mechanical keyboard at all. So this is Dell's maglev technology, and it's really, really crazy. That butterfly mechanism just holds the keys in place, mm -hmm. and then there's magnets below the keys right. that it work instead of a spring. Yeah. And they can actually increase or decrease the amount of magnetism to give you more or less of feel. So they're trying to make this super short travel keyboard feel like it has more yeah. travel. Yeah. You it's, despise it. I don't, I wouldn't say I despise it, but it is very, very hard to get used to, especially because there, there is some tactile feedback, but it's not what I'm used to on, for example, the Alienware mm -hmm. versions of keyboards or my mechanical keyboard that I have in the office. So this one is, it's, it's hard to get used to, but you can over a little bit of time. There is one upside, like they're claiming something insane like 12 million cycles per key. Which is really good. I've worn out keyboards on laptops. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I'm like down with anything that will make them last longer. Yeah. So. Uh, I also noticed that it is backlit, which is great. I love backlit keyboards and the keys are noticeable whenever you are in tablet modes because you can feel them when you're holding it in tablet mode, but they won't register any kind of clicks well, while you're in, in that mode mm -hmm. as well. Uh, another honorable mention that I should mention with this review on the 2-in-1, the 75 watt hour battery. So it only lasts about That's six hours. It's, it's a big battery. It's a big battery. It's a big battery. It should last a long time. But I think because this 4K screen takes so much mm -hmm. use, so much power to draw, it, it just draws it out. And, and it ends up just being about six hours of battery life if you keep that screen on. So the 4K screen is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's high res. Yes. It's 430 or $470 more than the 1080p that comes on Every other model. Exactly. And you can't really game at 4K. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure I had that right. Yes, you are correct. And I should probably mention the ports on here. 
basically, it's USB-C all over the place. It powers by USB-C. There's USB-C 3.1 all over the place. PowerShare, DC in, DisplayPort. So if you don't like USB-C, you probably won't enjoy this, but it does come with an adapter for USB-A, so which that, that I do really appreciate. There's also a headphone jack, which I love, <laughs> and there's a micro SD card reader, which, which I also lo love, and a Noble lock slot as well. Four USB-C slash Thunderbolt ports? Yep. So at least there are a lot of <laughs> USB C ports. There are. So I do appreciate that. You would just probably need an adapter for like flash drives and stuff. Um, I'm always in the need for high processing and a powerful GPU, but that's because I am a power user. I'm an editor. I do a lot of Lightroom. I do a lot of Adobe Premiere Pro, and I also really enjoy gaming. So if you are a gamer, gamer or an editor, then yeah, it's cool, but I feel like it's probably not the perfect one for you. However, if you're a power user that doesn't do editing, doesn't use gaming, the screen is gorgeous albeit it's very expensive. Uh, it would be a worthy upgrade from home or work use at mm -hmm. home if you have a few years old of a laptop, but if you want to save some money, you could totally stick with the 1080p version, still get the same internals, and save that money on that 4K screen. So, I mean, are you watching a lot of 4K <sighs> display uh, uh, you 4K know, creators content, content <laughs> right now? Because if you aren't, you could totally save the money and get that 1080p screen. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I feel. Let me know if you want to know more about this two-in-one because we'll have it in the office for a little bit longer before we send it back over to Dell. I, I would love to answer any questions that you have. It's a really cool one to mess around with and I really enjoy checking out different laptops. So any questions, send them my way at snubs or ask at techthing.com. It's April 2018. You know what that means? It is May 2018. Oh, yeah. Oh! Uh, well, it still means the big Windows 10 April update is actually rolling out. Yay! To everyone, TLDR, <laughs> it's the small things. Yes, it is. And timeline. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a new place to control startup apps, which Ooh. may be my favorite feature oh. in the update. I want to know more. Timeline. That's yes. the big deal. Do you ever use the task view button next to the start button in window? Um, that, is that one right there? Click on it. Sometimes. On it. Sometimes I do. Yeah. No, 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 no. That one right there. Oh, that one. Yeah, you don't ever nope, use that one. Nope, I never use that Nobody one. Nobody ever uses that one. Nope. <laughs> so Task View shows all the apps that are running on Windows 10. Um, Timeline, which is the update, mm -hmm. gives you 30 days of the apps and activities that have been run on your system. Whoa. It's a little trippy. It just yeah. kind of scrolls down and lets you know what was going on. Now, for those Edge fans out there, hi, Bob, Cindy. <laughs> we got you covered here. Uh, it gives you uh, the ability to basically uh, access on your iOS and Android Edge histories on your mobile devices if you want. And while we're talking about Edge, you now have tab muting, just like in Chrome. Ooh. And Microsoft says there are Edge performance bumps too, but I'll be honest, I am still not running it in place of Firefox, much less Chrome. Yep. I love the new startup app management. Startup apps can now be managed from settings, apps, startup. So instead of digging deep into the task manager and opening up the extra tabs and going over there and mm -hmm. cycling through, I turn off a ton of apps in the startup manager Same. and having it more accessible. <sighs> That's awesome. It's yeah. never been very user friendly. No. So I, good job, Microsoft. Possibly because they didn't want to tick off all the people making apps that are really excited about slowing down the startup. Too of bad. Your, yeah, really. <laughs> um, if you're one of the people who's who goes from like laptop to uh, a desktop dock and mm -hmm. all of your applications look like snot. Every single time. So the goal, big goal that we're working with on the April 2018 update to fix scaling for apps. So if you apps that look blurry uh, or uh, like, you know, when you're changing from your dock to your laptop and back, yeah. Windows 10 or Microsoft says Windows 10 can detect and will try to keep it from being too small or too blurry. I've been lucky. I haven't had too much call for this because mm -hmm. um, I think the resolution on my laptop is very, very close to the resolution on my ultra wide yeah. screen. Um, what's really crazy, and I haven't gotten to trigger it yet, is it's supposed to run a pop-up if it detects a blurry app. Really? And be like, you know, I, I'm, I'm mentioning <laughs> Windows like, does this look blurry? That's kind of um, cool, actually. And you can actually dig into settings, system display, advanced display settings. Um, so you have more per app settings if you want to override system DPI, scaling behavior, mm -hmm. um, or you can right click on the executable file. Uh, go to properties, compatibility, and go to the change high DPI settings. And this is, parts of this have been in there before, but I think Microsoft has really heard a lot of people complaining. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, it's such a frustrating thing. Well, it's good that they're being responsive to those. One would think. Yeah. <laughs> One would hope. <laughs> I would Windows hope. as a service suggests it would be 
serving all of us users. <laughs> yeah. Um, audio preferences. I am unnervingly excited about the ability to set audio preferences by application. Oh, Input. Yes or output. So Audacity or Skype, I can title my Focusrite Scarlett headset, title in Spotify, go to my desktop speakers or my hair, my head, my earphones, my headphones. Um, so no digging into the preferences when it's time to record AVXL or Twitch. That's, I'm so stupid. That's so nice. Excited about the like, go to the speaker and right click and open and switch and switch and switch and I, I yes! <laughs> Finally. Um, knowing notifications, do you find notifications distracting? Um, I do. You know. I usually turn off all my notifications because yeah. cool. it drives me nuts. If there are notifications you like, Focus Assist is the new quiet hours. Mm -hmm. So if you're duplicating your display, like running a PowerPoint presentation to a projector, mm -hmm. or if you're gaming in DirectX in full screen mode, notifications will automatically be muted. Yes. Yes. Awesome. You know, you can let important apps pop through if you choose. Uh, you know, like the, the previous version of this was quiet hours, yeah. which let you specify times. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mute my notifications between this time and this time. Right. Um, I like the idea. I'd like to also be able to tie it to individual apps. Like whenever I'm running this app, notifications can go die. Yeah. Excuse me. Absolutely. Notifications can wait until later. I never need no notifications when I'm playing video games or <laughs> if I'm like a Google Hangout or something. I'm like, no, I don't need this while I'm recording a podcast. Leave me alone. Yeah. Or like the Dropbox ones, the ones that are Oh, insane. those drive me nuts. Thing, They're thing, always thing. there. Yeah, I turn those off immediately. I should turn them off more. Mm -hmm. So I may have mentioned way at the beginning of this segment uh, that there are lots of little things like faster Bluetooth pairing via a notification that lets you pair without digging into the settings, cool. which I really, really like. Uh, unfortunately, the only thing that works with that is the Microsoft Surface Precision Mouse. Logitech's gear is coming. And the device managers uh, beyond that have to add support for this. Okay. You can manage fonts and settings and install them from the store. Settings, personalization, fonts, and you can view, install, and uninstall fonts. Cool. Better password recovery for local accounts. Um, you can basically, you know, update and set security questions, which is, you know, having had several passwords lost. Oh, security lost, questions. Security questions. I my get favorite. it, but given how many people we know that have lost passwords. Yeah. Um, you You're know. probably not going to be a target, but I am, so I fake my security questions. Fake all the questions. <laughs> you can suppress Windows Defender notifications now. Uh, you can share websites or photos or docs to Windows 10 machines uh, with nearby sharing over Bluetooth. they got more HDR video support. Like I said, the little things. Now, if you don't want to wait till the Windows upgrade rolls around to you, you can download the April 2018 update right now. And it's really simple. Windows 10 2018 April update, which is kind of like Windows 10 April 2018 update, except partially backwards. You download it, you double click on the executable, and it'll download all the files. Oh, so beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would hit the update now button, but I have work to do on this machine. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to have any surprises <laughs> on my primary production machine. Um, and basically, once you hit that executable, um, hit update now. And if your gear can roll with Windows 10 April 2018 update, one more click and you start the update, which takes a long time to download. And then once it's downloaded, it's <laughs> installing itself on your system and rebooting. <laughs> if you want to clean install from the ISO or install this, or you want to make a USB boot stick, look kids, there's the media creation tool oh, right cool. down below. I'm so glad they made that easy to find. Microsoft.com slash en dash us slash software dash download slash Windows 10. We'll put a link in the show notes. And if you've got a question, do us a favor, email us, ask at techthing.com. So far, the new update hasn't broken anything I run. <laughs> That's good, so far. Watch everything stop want. working this afternoon. <laughs> We love your questions, your tips, and your suggestions of products and ideas to check out. There are so many of you, and your ideas are awesome. Send them to ask at techthing.com, or you can tweet at techthing, at snubs, or at Patrick Norton. That's me. And a big shout out to our patrons at patreon.com slash techthing. You pay the bills, you make the show possible, and quite frankly, you keep my family fed. Thank you, patrons. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing happen at patreon.com slash techthing. And thank you all so much for supporting the show, no matter how you do it. We got an email from Brian. Hi, Brian. He says, hi, guys. Been watching the show a long time. I have a plasma TV that I love, but we moved, and now it's reflecting the windows behind where I sit. Mm. I was curious if you guys, including Mr. Heron, know of a way to fix this. Is there something to make it less reflective? Thanks from Brian. Oh, you know, that's man. a great question, and it I have the same question. issue in my living room. So please, Patrick, <laughs> please. Answer this for us. There's one thing I have to bring up. 
In the world of professional television production and photo studios, there's actually cans of stuff called dulling spray. What? Yeah. This exists? This exists. Cool. Uh, it doesn't really dry, uh, oh. so you can actually wipe it off. Because you know, <laughs> the idea is like, imagine if you're taking a picture of something and it's got like a really bad shiny thing yeah. and you can't change the lights or maybe because it's a studio or something yeah. like that. So the idea is you <laughs> spray this stuff on there and it kind of diffuses the glare okay. and makes it look duller. <laughs> You don't so it's like Pam cooking spray, but for your TV? Yeah, and not quite so, sl more sticky, less slick. <laughs> um, you don't want to spray it on your monitor lest you melt the screen or just trash yeah. the screen or just trash the coatings on the screen, all of which um, uh, are things you want to avoid. I know that's not very useful, but the stuff fascinates me and I've seen people do terribly wrong things with it with monitors, so don't put dulling spray on your monitor. If you're looking for an excuse to upgrade, Robert Heron mentioned that Samsung's got some pretty slick new anti-reflective coatings on their 2018 TVs, oh, but cool. since you have a beloved plasma, you're probably not ready to upgrade. <laughs> but if you are, that's one reason to go for the Samsung. That might be. That said, you really need to either A, move things around and relocate the screen so light doesn't reflect off of it. B, get window screens uh, that reduce the amount of light coming in the window, which are very, I didn't know about this, it's like, Window screens are kind of th made out of thicker stuff, mm -hmm. so they cut down the amount of light that comes into your house and all the amount of heat that comes into your house. Oh, that's They're very nice. big in the southern states, especially in the southwest. Cool. Uh, or you can put external sunshades outside your mm -hmm. windows. Or C, go the most effective route, curtains you can draw to block the light coming through the window. Okay. With my first projector, full-on blackout curtains were the only way to use its weak-ass bulb during the day. <laughs> Um, depending on how strong the sun is in your situation or your locale, that might be the fix. Um, there are aftermarket anti-glare films you can apply to your TV. One of the ones that's out there is New Shield. And you can kind of see it over here. Um, this is where the New Shield is and this is where it isn't, Whoa. right? Um, it's pretty crazy. These look really slick. Uh, they make for tablets and phones, but imagine applying a 65 inch adhesive film to your monitor. Oh man, I would have so many wrinkles. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really bad at applying films to my cell phone. It scares me a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, your cell phone's this big. Yeah. And you're like, meep, 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 meep. Mm -hmm. Now imagine a 65 inch screen. I would be terrible at that. Um, <laughs> the folks at New Shield said it'll do a great job of say keeping your bright white couch from being reflected on the screen, but direct sunlight is gonna be brighter than your TV can fight off. Uh, though the matte screen will help a little bit. There's okay. a similar th substance uh, over at Glare Stopper. Um, you know, they do a similar demo where it's like, oh, this is the uncovered, no, right. this is the covered half, this is the uncovered half. And it's okay. like, oh, look, there's dad and dad's legs and there's not dad's body reflected in the screen. <laughs> um, so there are a ton of options out there. By far, if you can do it, relocating the monitor or covering those windows yeah. is gonna do a better job than anything else. That's pretty much the only thing I thought of so far as to yeah. just tilt the TV a little bit so it doesn't get the reflection from the windows bouncing off. Oh yeah, that's a good point. If you can <sighs> tilt the yeah, TV a little bit. That's, that's pretty much the only thing I found that worked in my living room was just moving it a little bit. It was amazing when we upgraded our projector, mm -hmm. we could now actually have light in the room and still see colors on the screen. Really? But wow. that was, we, you know, we almost tripled the lumens. The, between like oh, the, the 2006 projector and the 2015 projector, the yep. number of lumens coming out went up by like a factor <laughs> of three point something, so. Let us know if you have any questions as well about uh, home theater. And also you should mention AVXL. Hi, my name is Patrick Norton. I work with Robert Heron on a weekly podcast called AVXL, which covers the best in home theater and audio gear, no matter what your budget is. Yes, it's a great show. You should check it out if yeah. you haven't yet. I support you guys too. Yes! It's awesome. AVXL.com. <laughs> And if you want to check out anything else on our end, um, you can tweet us at TechThing. Answer, we'll answer all those questions. We answer all the questions. All of them. Except for the deeply personal ones that make us nervous. <laughs> we got a tweet from Josh who says, what are your opinions on the best NAS and RAID drives for backing up ripped Blu-rays? Looking to rip a total of about 250 discs and need quite a bit of space, but want it to continue being reliable down the road. Thank you so much, Josh. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? So I, we both run Synology NASs. Yes, we do. Uh, I'm pretty sure we both run Western Digital Reds inside yep. of them. Yep. Um, Seagate's been making grounds. They're doing a lot more. They're doing their own sort of dedicated series of NAS-based drives that also have red on the label Ooh. and horses. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the Western Digitals have worked really, really well for me for a bunch of years, so I'm sticking with them. If you go to, for example, the Amazon webpage for the WD Reds, um, 
They run from one terabyte, can't really get the size in there, to 10 terabytes. So a one terabyte drive sells for 62 bucks, that's 16 cents a gigabyte. Three terabytes, 115 bucks, 26 cents a gigabyte. Four terabytes through 10 terabytes pretty much averages uh, 32 cents a gigabyte and oh the wow. drives individually cost anywhere from 125 up to $318. Kind of a big difference. Yeah, well, so when you're, when you're buying NAS drives, you need to verify, you need to go to the support page for your NAS manufacturer's yep. website and verify that your NAS will read the drives. Yes, absolutely. Because um, there would be nothing more awkward than being like, I just bought $2,400 worth of 10 terabyte drives that my NAS can't read. Yeah. <laughs> and that I can't return out of the box. Well, I'm pretty sure you could return them, but it would just... Yeah, Amazon has a good return policy, which is nice, but <laughs> other ones might not. I feel like four terabytes is the sweet spot. Yeah. Because it's kind of crazy, right? You, you go from like, what did I say, 24 cents to 32 cents per yeah. gigabyte between the three terabyte and the four terabyte, but the price difference, you know, you're talking about 10 bucks. Oh, wow. So, yeah. 30% more huh. space. Cool. But the six terabyte. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 184. Yeah, a little bit of an increase there. 50% hmm. more storage for a 30% increase in price. Hmm. I could do this all day, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're as good as me at the budgeting thing and finding all the coupons well, and like the deals. The four terabyte, the three terabyte. <laughs> well, the other thing is there are six, to, and I should I don't have the name of the viewer who reminds us of this. Mm -hmm. There are external drives that sell for considerably less than $184 that have six terabyte reds inside of them that are available from Western Digital. Whoa. So you can go to Best Buy and buy like a six terabyte. You know what? Here, you should do thank Darren and the crew. You know, I should thank Darren and Hack5. We do want to give a quick shout out to Hack5 for the studio space here. You can definitely check out Hack5, grab some Hack5 gear, and check out all the security and privacy podcasts that I do, as well as Mr. Darren Kitchen over at hek5.org. I feel like this is the drive, but it's sold out. Oh. Yeah. $140 for a six terabyte drive. I will investigate. Okay, cool. If, if you do find it, just week. stick it in the show notes and people can look down there. No, we'll talk about it next week. Okay, that sounds good too. <laughs> I just want to keep talking about NAS drives. <laughs> well, we should mention an analog pick this week. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, once in a while, put down the phone, step away from the screen, close the laptop, and do something analog, like Thomas, who emailed asketechthing.com. Hello, Shannon and Patrick. Last month, Shannon tweeted that she missed out on the cherry blossoms in Japan this spring. I did. It was totally a coincidence that I was in the right place at the right time as I was visiting my sister, who's in the Pacific Fleet. <gasps> what? Go, sister. I know it's a little late, but here are a few photos of the great Buddha in Kamakura. Kamakura. The Daibatsu. Daibutsu. Thank you. <laughs> the whole area was just lovely, and the walk up the street to the Daibatsu, Daibutsu, Daibutsu was just packed with little shops and street vendors with oh, awesome food. Love it. It's no replacement for a real trip to Japan, but I hope it can bide Shannon over for a little while longer and maybe convince Patrick to visit. Aww. Thomas. Thank you, Thomas, fellow ham radio nerd. I love it. I oh have actually visited Japan. My wife taught English in Japan for a year, oh, and that's someday right. when we can score the money to take all four children, no, all four, well, we all are four children, uh, we, will, uh, we will get back to Japan. Awesome. I love it so much. And your pictures are wonderful, Thomas. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Cherry that's blossoms. That's the daibutsu. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, the sakura. It's so pretty. It's so Arigato. <laughs> Arigato thomas -san. Appreciate so it, man. And if you have an analog pick that you want to share with us, whether it's travel related or something really cool that you did around town or just a really neat build or something that you did with your family, definitely share with us. Ask at techning.com. We would love to share the positivity with the rest of our fans. Looking for some tabletop game recommendations. Ooh, yeah. By the way, if you have a solution for running Minecraft with small children, I'm all ears. <laughs> I'm also Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons. Oh, I love it. The, those pictures of the sakura trees and the daibutsu and everything, man, that's so cool. Kamakura is one place that I have not been yet, but I do intend to go. Last time I went to Japan, I went to Sendai, Osaka, Nara, and Kyoto in Tokyo. That's a lot of cities. I'm wondering how Tristan would deal with the ass biting here. <laughs> Just don't let him like put the crackers in his back pocket because honestly, 
it hurts, I've been there, there is video on my YouTube channel of one actually doing that to me. And it's it biting yeah. you off the possible. Yes, finger. it hurts. So don't do it. <laughs> it's not fun. Pro tip, sometimes they bite you on the ass even when you have no cookies in your pocket. <laughs> Just to get your attention. Yeah, and then yeah. you turn around and there's this deer, which is like a big dog, going like, Yo! Give me a cookie! <laughs>